I bring you greetings from uh, 44 West 4th Street uh, in the village. Uh, as uh, Philip said, we've brought uh, a small uh, delegation with us because we are, uh, we're delighted to, uh, to interact with um, students, faculty, alumni, members of the business community, and, and, and generally members of, uh, of the community here in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we're especially delighted uh, this evening to be part of a conversation uh, about uh, current economic conditions. And we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Ed Altman, uh, the Max L. Heine Professor of Finance at the NYU Stern uh, School of Business. Uh, Professor Altman, Ed, uh, has a long list of accolades that I could, I could run through. I won't, I, won't, I won't run through all of them. I think the most relevant thing <clears throat> uh, for the discussion here this evening um, is that uh, Ed wrote in 1968 uh, a very seminal article in the Journal of Finance. Uh, in which he looked at um, uh, various predictors of uh, bankruptcy and the things that led to, lead to financial distress in firms. And, and this article led to uh, the, the coining of a, of, of, of a phrase called the, the Altman Z-score, which has become synonymous with, with, with Ed uh, and has had uh, a great impact not only in academia, but a great impact on, on industry, uh, issues of, of, of bankruptcy and default in a corporate setting. And one of the things that we really pride ourselves on at the Stern School is our ability to continue to innovate. And Ed is nothing if not an innovator and an academic uh, and intellectual entrepreneur. And so when the, the, the economic conditions turned recently, in the past couple of years, uh, coming out of the, the, the financial crisis that we've had in the past couple of years, one of the big issues now facing the world, of course, uh, is sovereign default risk. Uh, Moving from the issues that we were uh, faced with with banks uh, during the financial crisis, the big quest one of the big questions of the day is what will happen with the Port Portugal's, the Ireland's, and the Greece's of the world. Uh, so never resting on, on his laurels, uh, Ed's of the world, uh, Z-score uh, techniques, and pioneered a new, uh, a new attempt to look at, uh, look at uh, issues of, of sovereign default. Uh, and, and, and extended uh, his Z-score techniques to what's now, I believe, called Z-metric, uh, a new way of looking at uh, sovereign default but using the, the lens that uh, Ed had developed uh, uh, over, over 40 years ago in this, in this seminal article that I mentioned. So we're very pleased, we're very fortunate uh, to have tonight uh, Ed Altman. And Ed, I welcome you to the stage, and we look forward to what you have to tell us about, uh, about this novel approach to looking at uh, sovereign default. Thank you very much, um, uh, both uh, Peter and uh, Philip, for your uh, wonderful introductions and for inviting uh, uh, me here tonight. Uh, it's a great, really, pleasure and honor to uh, follow uh, many uh, distinguished speakers who, if you've come to the series that the Abu Dhabi NYU Institute has put on, you probably uh, have been um, um, aware of uh, the broad range of the speakers and indeed, um, Philip and his staff here at the Institute, and indeed NYU in general here in uh, Abu Dhabi are responsible for that and many other very important innovations and very pleased to be part of that. Philip didn't tell you, by the way, that we were next door neighbors in New York for, I don't know, five, six years. Our families knew each other. We knew very little about each other's careers except that you know, we would see each other in the elevator, uh, sometimes would happen. And, Lo and behold, we're here together again uh, here. Uh, I apologize for being a little late. Um, actually, uh, uh, it was about right on time, but there was some miscommunication with my driver. And actually, um, drivers have played a pretty important role in my life every so often. Uh, I remember Elaine and I were at a conference in the south of France um, a couple of years ago, and uh, Elaine asked me, if there was time to go to the fish market to see this uh, supposedly famous fish market in, uh, in Nice. And I said, yes, but I have to get back for a speech. I'm giving a speech at the hotel at about 10.30. Uh, and so we went to the fish market. And about 8.30, my cell phone goes off, and it's my driver. Um, whenever I'm in the north of Italy and the south of France and I'm doing some work, for an organization called the Centrale di Balanci, which is like a giant balance sheets clearinghouse um, with data from over 50,000 um, 
uh, commercial loans uh, from the Italian banks, um, I always get driven around by the same driver, and his name is Mario. And Mario, um, who, by the way, was one of the original employees of this organization, was calling me, and he said, Professori, where are you? And I said, well, I'm at the fish market. He said, no, no, Professori, you should be at the hotel. There are 1,000 people waiting for you to speak. <laughs> and I said, no, M Mario, you got it all wrong. I'm supposed to be there, but not for another um, uh, two hours. He said, uh, Professor, I'm there, and uh, they are waiting for you. Uh, may I ask you what you're speaking about today? And I said, well, I'm talking about managing credit risk. And he said, oh, Professor, I've heard you give that speech so many times. Maybe today I can give it for you. <laughs> and I said, Mario, you have to understand, this is a highly sophisticated audience, um, and the talk is quite complicated with many uh, mathematical equations. He said, may I ask you, do they know what you look like? I said, no, I don't think so. It's the first time I'm speaking to this group. And he said, well, you are there, I'm here. What chance do, other chance do we have? So I said, OK, Mario, if you think you can pull this off, you can give the speech, and I'll get there as soon as I can. But I'm sure I won't get there until the end. So sure enough, Elaine and I go back to the hotel, and uh, uh, I uh, stand in the back, and. Uh, we had agreed to reverse the roles today, and he would be the professor. So um, uh, he be, he's finishing his speech, and he's doing a fantastic job. Probably uh, he's got all the timing right, the equations correct, and he finishes, and I'm feeling much better, and he gets this huge round of applause, probably more than I've ever received. Um, and he finishes, and he's looking really happy, and I'm really feeling very comfortable in the back now, and then the moderator says, well, Professor Altman, is there time for one or two questions? And now I see Mario beginning to sweat and feel a little uh, uneasy, and I'm feeling very um, uncomfortable myself. And he says, well, OK, one or two. And sure enough, this distinguished scientist in the back of the room asked this incredibly difficult, complex question. And now I see Mario really beginning to sweat, and I'm feeling oh, very uh, uneasy. Uh, but this Mario is a very clever fellow, and he said, you know, sir, that question is really so simple. Even my chauffeur in the back of the room can answer it. <laughs> well, um, tonight it almost happened that my chauffeur would have to give the speech, although uh, I, I did make it on time. Uh, more seriously, oh, by the way, uh, after the, uh, when the reception, if you catch me in the corner, I'll tell you, that indeed two thirds of that story uh, is true. And uh, you can perhaps figure out the other third, but uh, we'll, we can discuss that afterwards. Um, tonight, as Peter uh, introduced so well, the uh, discussion that I'm going to uh, um, work with you on, and I, I realize it's a challenge because many of the topics I'm going to talk about in leading up to this issue of sovereign uh, risk and default uh, potential. Uh, is not necessarily a field that you are familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, we all read about the great financial crisis that we lived through. Many of you felt it personally or heard about it. So uh, what I'd like to do is um, do two things, really, really three. Uh, talk to you a little bit about the evolution of that crisis that we all lived through in one form or another. Uh, what happened before, during, and after, kind of like a tale of three uh, periods, uh, and then talk about the current situation and whether or not we're out of the woods, so to speak, or there is some looming other potential crisis out there that we have to understand very well that perhaps we can do something about, or at least uh, to be prepared should it uh, erupt into something even more uh, serious than it is today. Um, and so that'll, that's my challenge uh, to work with you. I'd be happy to answer questions both uh, uh, during if there's a clarification question and certainly at the end. This chart looks a little intimidating, but it is a chart that tells the story, I think, quite well of what we went through. This is what we call the risk premium or um, uh, spread between uh, so-called high-yield junk bonds 
which are bonds issued by risky companies whose rating from the rating services is non-investment grade, below investment grade, and the risk-free rate, uh, and I use as our proxy for that the uh, U.S. 10-year Treasury rate. So the risk-free rate versus the yield on uh, high-yield bonds is what we call the risk premium. And that is a great barometer of the required return of investors and how risky the investors feel the market is going to be in the future and therefore what they require as compensation for that risk. If you look on the left-hand side, uh, uh, and I've chosen June 12, 2007 as the um, uh, date uh, for when the meltdown in credit markets and financial markets began, that rate, that spread was 260 basis points, or to put it more simply, 2.6%. 2.6%, to give you a, a frame of reference, is about one half the historic average that investors normally require. So we were living in, at that point, a very benign credit cycle, one that um, was, in my opinion, and I wrote some things uh, for a few journals at that time, uh, both practitioner-oriented and scholarly, that it was very abnormal, unusual, and could not continue. Because everything we teach in finance, and I've been teaching finance at the Stern School now for 44 years, and I was wondering, was I teaching something wrong, or was the world ready for a, uh, a crisis that some people were thinking about, but everyone was living through this fantasy land of low interest rates, uh, amazing amount of liquidity, credit. People were building all over. You know very well what was going on in this uh, part of the world in 2007. And, um, and something was wrong, because investors were getting incredibly low returns, spreads of the lowest in the history of the market, for what I considered running some of my models on the firms that comprised this market, incredibly high risk. So everything we talk about, normally high risk, high return, was upside down. You were getting low return for high risk. And we wrote about this, and my colleague uh, Norio Rubini, who you may have uh, heard about, also was writing about it for a different reason. And we both were predicting a meltdown of different types. And indeed, it happened. He was uh, perhaps more prescient than I in terms of the catalyst, but it was the mortgage-backed securities market in the U.S., which was the catalyst for our financial crisis. And notice that spread then began to increase in the summer of 07. It continued to increase. The historic average spread, by the way, 525 basis points, or 5.25%, which is about twice what it was in June 07. And it continued to go up. The catalyst for the, uh, in the meltdown, however, was the bankruptcy of a major investment bank. You've all probably heard of Lehman Brothers, or maybe know someone who used to work for them, or is, um, uh, they owed them some money. But anyway, they went bankrupt in September 08. And the spread jumped from about 800 to 1800. And then went as high in December. Let's see if there's a pointer up here. December 2008 went to 2,000 and 46 basis points. Let me give you an idea of what that means. 2,000 basis points above the risk-free rate was not only the highest it ever was in the history of capital markets, it was 10% higher than it ever was. The highest ever before was 1991, when it was about 1,100. This was almost 2,100 basis points. Also, the capital markets were locked up. Nobody was lending to anyone. Banks couldn't lend from other banks. Companies couldn't lend from banks or investors. Uh, sovereign wealth funds like uh, uh, exist here and in, uh, in other parts. Is anybody here from the uh, Abu Dhabi uh, uh, Investment Authority? Okay, we have a few. You may remember what was going on uh, then, if you were here then, or you were somewhere place else. Um, uh, nothing was going on in the capital market. Everything was locked. And people were fearful that the new paradigm for financial markets was this situation and it would continue. 
Um, fortunately, it didn't. And notice that that spread began to come down in the beginning of 2009, and particularly after April 2009, when it was about 1800, it began to go, not began, it fell furiously, um, dropping to 442, and today around 400. So we are today about 125 basis points, or 1.25 percent, below the historic average. Things are good again in the credit markets. Banks are beginning to lend, bond markets are uh, the most buoyant ever, and things seemingly are a little bit like they were in 2007. A little bit higher when it was 260 then and now it's 397, but not that much different in terms of the amazing amount of liquidity in the system again. Um, and so now we have to ask ourselves the question, is today a not only normal but indeed a very benign good situation for capital to flow to various aspects of the world's economy and that the outlook is extremely positive and buoyant and investment will again start in all over the world? Well, maybe. Certainly there are, it's much better than it was a year or two ago, but there are some trouble signs out there that I'd like to refer to you and then lead into the major discussion uh, tonight. And that is the situation dealing with about six or seven bullets, of which I'll only deal with one or two in detail, and the rest I'll just mention. First of all, and this is no longer a major question, but it is an important question, is it likely or not that the United States economy will go back into a recession, the so-called double dip? Um, uh, if I'd asked this question three months ago, maybe six months ago, I would say the average audience would have said something like 30% probability of this happening. Today, it's probably at most 10%. In other words, the probability of the U.S. going into a recession and throwing the rest of the world into a recession, or most of the rest of the world, with us is probably under 10%. And the latest numbers coming out on employment, the unemployment rate is now down, still very high at 8.8%, uh, but uh, things are looking better, investment is coming back, uh, and despite the fact that we've got turmoil in the Middle East and we've got the tsunami and radioactivity problems in Japan, uh, which generally cause investors to get very concerned and more risk averse, it hasn't really affected the markets that much. Stock markets went down a bit, certainly in Japan, but not so much in the rest of the world. And so the chance of that happening is probably relatively small, at least in the near term. And the default rates that generally follow the um, uh, recessions don't look like they're going to rise, at least in the near term. This chart shows you the last six recessions in the United States, relatively short ones, and the line graph shows you the um, um, uh, default rate on high-yield junk bonds. I, at the Stern School, we have a little institute there. Uh, institute is too much to call it. It's really a little um, uh, think, uh, think tank there. And one of the things we do is calculate on a regular basis defaults, bankruptcies, and the like. I have to admit, maybe apologize, that I love defaults. I love bankruptcies. And as a scientist, you need data points to do your analysis. And so, um, you know, when you have a lot of defaults, like if you take a look at this graph here, this shows you the time series of default rates on junk bonds or high-yield bonds over the last 30 years or so. And notice we've had three periods of double-digit default rates. And a double-digit default rate, 10, 11, 12, 13 percent, is very high. The historic average is around 4, 4.5 percent on these risky bonds. So 1990-91, again 01-02, and 2009 were extremely high default periods. We love default so much, my wife and I have this little tradition of opening up a bottle of fine red wine every time there's a big bankruptcy. Sorry about that. Um, and if there are one or two 
uh, more than one or two in a short period of time, we move to the fine champagne. Well, in 01 and 02, and again, 1991, we were drunk all the time. It was just you know, a wonderful liquid period for the Altman family. Uh, we're in a bit of a liquidity crisis now. There's just not much going on in the bankruptcy world to speak about, uh, but we're hopeful uh, that uh, things will change. Now, you have to understand, when you talk about bankruptcies of companies, this is very normal. Companies come and go. If they're not efficient, effective with respect to their operation, they should default go out of business or get restructured, just like countries. But countries cannot be liquidated, like companies. So you have to do other things to keep countries alive, so to speak, and make them vibrant, wonderful places to live in, and places that you'd want to work in. Well, we're going to be talking about that in a moment. So going back then to the list, the first um, uh, question mark for, for the future, which does impact default rates and uh, yield spreads in credit markets and capital markets is the U.S. economy because it is the largest economy by far in the world still, although China is catching up, uh, and therefore it impacts what goes on in the rest of the world. The second uh, item, the sovereign debt crisis, and particularly, as Peter mentioned, what's going on in Europe today. This is clearly, if I had to uh, put a um, pointer on a market or an issue that we not only know about and actually can put some probabilities on with respect to defaults and their ramifications. This is one area that there's been a lot of discussion on, a lot of analysis done. I can guarantee you that there are an incredible number of investors, hedge funds, sovereign wealth funds, um, pension funds, mutual funds, who have uh, their ears to the floor, so to speak, listening for rumblings in these countries that we're going to talk about and how that affects not only their potential to default, but also opportunities to invest in the bonds and loans of these countries. Because along with high default risk is high yields. And in today's market, where interest rates are so low, particularly in the United States, and Japan, investors look for alternative investments to get higher yields. And one of the reasons why the high yield bond market has done so well in the last two years, almost two years now in the US, is this quest for higher yield, which of course means higher risk. So you have to weigh the two, and now the weighting is particularly centered on Europe. Let me give you a little idea of what's happened in Europe in the last few years to give you a little background as to why I got interested in this field. Since my original work, which started in bankruptcy prediction models, building mathematical statistical models to evaluate the default risk of companies, and then it evolved into areas like high yield bonds, I mentioned distressed debt, did you know that there is an industry in the United States in particular, and, and somewhat in the rest of the world, that is dedicated to investing in problem loans and bonds of companies, and now countries. It's called the distressed debt industry. I have many colleagues, friends, and particularly ex-students who are working in this field. They're affectionately called vultures, you know, because they're looking to uh, pick on the, uh, the dead carcass, but that's not really true. They're not really vultures. A distressed investor wants the company that they're investing in to rehabilitate, to restructure and come out as a going concern, because then the prices of the securities, the debt and equity of the company in particular, will rise just like the mythical phoenix. And so a distressed investor, which by the way can also provide new capital to the sick enterprise, is in a position to make extremely high yields if it works. And if it doesn't, they have a way of determining what is the floor value or liquidation value of the enterprise. So now we move to the current hotspot, which is, um, at least financially speaking, Europe. Um, we all began to worry about Europe only in the beginning of 2009, at best, and certainly uh, at the, uh, the end of 2009. 
What happened was we found out that Greece, indeed, its deficit to its uh, GDP level, to its uh, size of its economy, was much higher than we thought. Were they cooking the books? That's hard to say. But certainly, it was revealed by the new administration that, in fact, their deficit was much greater. Instead of 6%, it was 13%, or something in that range. And 13% deficit, plus a very high level of debt to GDP, over 100%, could be 150. I think the highest in the world now is Japan, along with, um, I learned, uh, uh, the gentleman from uh, Lebanon here. Yes? You're still here, and you admit it, but uh, OK, that's good. Um, um, very high debt to GDP in Lebanon. Uh, countries that borrow a lot relative to their size are vulnerable because they may not have the resources to repay, to pay the interest on the debt, and certainly to pay back the debt when it comes due. And all of a sudden, we got concerned about Greece, a member of the European uh, Union, an economic union, not a political union. Remember this, it would be very important, the difference between economic and political unions. Uh, and so we began to worry about Greece and its ability to pay back its debt. Well, generally, in terms of sovereign crises, we as investors or analysts or observers find out about the problem oftentimes too late. Too late meaning that if we had known about it earlier, we would have taken our money out or at least not reinvested. And this is the case of Greece and now in other countries like uh, Portugal, uh, Ireland, uh, Spain, and perhaps others. So I began to think about this. And I said, well, you know, I've been look, working in this field for a long time, but I've never built a model to predict sovereign defaults. It's only company defaults. Company defaults seem to be a lot easier to do than sovereigns, because we always find out too late about the sovereign problem. Uh, well, we find out uh, late anyway, whether it's too late to take our money out is, is an, uh, depends on the crisis like Russia in 1998, Argentina in 2000, uh, and a number of other ones. So I began to say, well, what is it about the way us scientists and also professionals evaluate sovereign debt? And I began to realize that we always look at it from the top down. We look at debt to GDP, uh, productivity, unemployment, uh, comparative advantage, um, deficits to GDP, and these are all macroeconomic variables. And then I remembered something that happened back in 1997. And let me ask you a question to motivate what I'm talking about. In 1997, we had another region of the world go through a financial crisis. Some of you may remember it was Southeast Asia, and it spread to East Asia. Thailand, Indonesia, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, all these countries either defaulted or were on the verge of default and had to be bailed out by the IMF or some other World Bank or some other uh, mechanism restructuring of its debt. And so I asked the question now to you, which was the question that we asked back then, what country of all of Asia, all of Asia, in 1996, before the crisis was understood or even realized by the uh, financial world, what country had the most vulnerable private sector to financial distress and bankruptcy of any country in Asia? Private sector, Asia. What country would you chose as, choose as having the most risk of defaulting in the private sector? Any guesses? Korea. Well, you know, there's always one guy in the crowd who spoils what you want to do. Yes, you're right, damn it. It is Korea. You were there. Korea, incidentally, at that time was double A minus rating from the rating agency, Standard & Poor's and Moody's uh, equivalent. A double A minus is almost the best you can get. It had been growing at more than 10% a year GDP growth for a decade. 
Do you remember the so-called Asian tigers? It was one of the tigers with the largest teeth. And yet, it was most vulnerable because it, the companies borrowed more than they could ever pay back if the banks, which were supporting them in a very um, um, methodical way, being told by the government, you will support the banks, uh, sorry, you will support the firms, and we'll support you if there's any problem. One morning, the central bank woke up and looked themselves in the mirror and said, we've got a bit of a problem here. If more than two banks fail, that will cost us, prop two of the big banks fail, that will cost us close to 50 billion US dollars to bail them out. Just think of how much money has been used to bail out the banks in Ireland today. $50 billion was exactly the amount of foreign country reserves that the central bank had. Uh, sorry, the, the country had, and it was sitting with the central bank. So they said, we cannot bail out continuously the banks if they get into trouble. So they said to the banks, you're going to have to ride this out on your own. And the banks all of a sudden said to, the, to their customers, we can no longer refinance you at ridiculously low interest rates to keep you alive because we might not survive ourselves. And overnight, seven or eight of the top 30 Cherbols, which are these giant uh, conglomerate companies in, in Korea, went bankrupt. And the country itself went from double A minus to double B minus in about six to nine months and would have defaulted except for a bailout by the IMF of that same $50 billion. If you had run my original Z-score model on every Asian country companies, Korea would have looked most vulnerable. In 1996, before the crisis. So this was, and by the way, I didn't actually do this. This was done by a World Bank study and published in 1970, 97, 98. So, and I filed this away as something really interesting and different from my ever thought about application of statistical credit scoring models, which is what this Z-score model is all about. Well, fast forward now to 2009 and 2010. What countries in Europe would have looked most vulnerable and by how much? And how did it compare with what the financial markets were saying about these very same com companies? And this presents this new approach to assess sovereign debt risk. Rather than go through all the gory details of, of the empirical work here, let me summarize our results with this one table. A lot of numbers, but I'll try to take you through it. Uh, incidentally, this model has some flaws in it, and we are working out the flaws. This is a work in progress. Even though we've published an article on it, we are going to do more work because we know it can be improved and I'll explain how it can be improved as, after I give you the, um, the basics. The first two columns, the first column lists the nine European countries plus the United States that we uh, did the analysis on, and the next two columns show the number of uh, listed companies, non-financial, no banks yet, in the data uh, that we gathered data from. The fourth column shows you this new model called Z-Metrics and from this new model that we've built in partnership with a risk consulting firm called Risk Metrics, um, gives the analyst the one and five year probability of default of any company in the world that we can get data on. Keep that in mind. This is the one or five year PD, we call it, which is a central um, metric used by investors all over the world to assess whether or not how much of a return they should require given the probability of default of the enterprise. Remember now, we're still at the enterprise level, not at the sovereign level. So, uh, if you look at 2010 and one year earlier, 2009, the beginning of each year, approximately, you can see that Greece, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Spain were by far the highest in terms of the five-year PD for the median company. Now, 
I understand that median may not be the right metric. Median meaning the 50th percentile company. There's 50% companies more risky and 50% less risky using the median as opposed to the average. So this is the median company in each country. At the beginning of 2009, it was Portugal and Greece, 11.5 and 12.0, standing out with Italy not too far behind. I'm going to come back to Italy in a moment because Italy is incredibly important. Besides making incredible pasta and an area that Elaine and I love to visit, in fact, uh, we'll be going back there in a few days, um, it is also what I call the fulcrum country in Europe right now. And I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Um, and so this shows from the bottom up the health of the sovereign irrespective of the macro data. Now it turns out that it's pretty consistent with the macro data, but it's the type of thing you can calculate if you are a member of the central bank or a member of a hedge fund or a sovereign wealth fund on a regular basis if you have a model and access to the data. In the beginning of 2009, the results show those three countries in particular that were most vulnerable. Turns out in 2010, the probability of defaults actually lessened. Now that's very strange. So I had to scratch my head first and say, what's wrong with the model? How can Greece, and I'll show you what another market said about Greece in a moment, Greece, Portugal, etc., decrease in risk by our model when indeed we know things seem to be getting worse. At least we're told that in the newspapers and you know, the European Central Bank is, you know, have bailout funds already for Greece and Ireland, likely to happen in Portugal, and uh, these funds are there to uh, give assurances that the European Union is going to stay together and the euro as we know it. And I'm carrying around some euros now because when I need it when I get back, it's still going to be a viable currency in the future. This, by the way, is the big risk. That euro, the euro itself will implode. And the European Union as we know it will fall apart. This will have reverberations not only in Europe, but here in Abu Dhabi, in uh, Japan, in the United States, in China, everywhere in the world. And this is something that is incredibly important. There's a political issue that is, goes far beyond any economic model we can uh, put forward. But we're going to get that in a second and maybe ask some questions on that. And so we see that the bottom-up approach would have predicted these companies are in countries in trouble, not necessarily that they default, but we should have been aware that Greece was in much worse shape than what we were told. At that time, the interest rates were really low in Greece, and they were able to get money very easily. Let me show you, oh, one other thing, the last two columns. I don't know how many of you have heard of this market, so this is a bit of a challenge, called the credit default swap market. Let me tell you, it's the biggest derivative market in the world outside of interest rate swaps. And a credit default swap is nothing more than an insurance policy. Somebody buys a policy, buys protection against default, and pays a premium, like insurance premium, on a quarterly basis, sometimes with an upfront fee, if in fact default risk is high. So suppose I'm a bank and I'm worried about a company. I go to my broker and I say, I want to buy protection. In case it defaults, I'm not going to lose any money. They say, okay, you got to pay for it. Somebody on the other side says, I'm willing to take that risk and provide you protection, but I got to receive this premium. So that's a credit default swap. It's a huge market. At its peak in 2007, $66 trillion a year traded in this market. 66 trillion. Today it's down to about 40 trillion. It's still huge. And this market is a instantaneous, up-to-date, continuous market for the risk. This shows you a graph of the CDS implied probability of default that investors uh, are paying premiums on and therefore for Greece starting in 09 on the left it was about 18 percent it dropped down 
in 2009 through the end of 2009 uh, to under 10%. Under 10% is mild risk. It is not extraordinary. The market still was thinking Greece would not default. Look at it now. It's over 50%, and probably today it's 60, around 60%, because this only goes through October. I have it through December. I have to update it. That means we are betting, we being the market, that Greece will default. And I'm convinced Greece will default. Now, you might say, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Well, on the one hand, Greece is tiny. And under 3% of the GDP of all the Euro European uh, Union. But Greece is not the problem. The problem is contagion to other countries. And it already happened in Ireland for very different reasons. There, the banks, uh, like the many of the US banks and the UK banks, uh, went way beyond their means in terms of uh, investing in uh, mortgage related securities and, uh, and mortgages themselves. But now the market is saying Greece is in trouble, and we all know it. Yet, there is this bailout fund, and the European community is saying we will not let Greece default. Then why are people paying such high premiums? They don't believe it, because the amount of debt that Greece has outstanding is unsustainable, unless they restructure. Now, whether Peter and other people can help Greece in terms of how they restructure, I know all I can tell you is they need what I call a soft default. A soft default says two consenting adults agree to receive less than we contracted for when we wrote the original contract, mainly buying your bond. I believe it's going to happen. It has to happen. I don't see how it can't. I don't see how Greece is going to become competitively that strong to withstand uh, its debt burden. But I think it's going to happen in a very soft way, meaning we're going to get a string of good news coming from Greece. Uh, unemployment is going down a little bit. Um, uh, productivity is going up. Uh, we're cutting down on pensions. We're raising the pension age. All the good things that the IMF and the World Bank says they should do austerity programs. Well, austerity programs, now this is very debatable. Do they work or not? An austerity program says you're in trouble, therefore you've got to get your house in order. You've got to spend less, you've got to receive more, you've <clears throat> got to become more productive, but usually the way a country gets out of trouble is to devalue its currency. Then it becomes more competitive. But Greece cannot devalue their currency, because their currency is the euro, not the drachma. How did Argentina finally get out of its trouble? It you know, was unlinked to the dollar and then devalued the peso. So Greece is in trouble, but not there yet. And I don't think it's going to happen, but I think we're going to see some good news. In my opinion, good news is going to be bad news in this case. But it's, we're going to be told that Greece is not doing too badly. But we already know that Ireland is in terrible trouble. It had to be bailed out too. Its banks uh, and its stress tests show that the banks are very weak. Next is Portugal. Portugal is gone. There's no way Portugal is going to make it. And they're going to need the bailout also. So what's the fulcrum country? Many people say Spain. Spain is much larger than Portugal. Spain is twice as large in terms of outstanding debt than Greece. But Spain, as big and as important as it is in the European Union, is small relative to the ability of the central bank in, in Europe to support it. But Italy is not. Italy is four times, almost four times larger than Spain in terms of its outstanding government debt. Yes, there is some differences. A lot of the Italian people own the debt of the government and the banks, maybe 60, 65 percent of all outstanding Italian debt is owned by Italians. And you know what you do when your own people own the debt. You tell them to keep investing in it, right? Because you've got to keep us going. 
But I'm not so sure that telling them to do it is going to work too much longer. And anyway, 40% or more is owned by hedge funds now, pension funds, banks, etc. And they don't have to follow what Mr. Berlusconi says they should do. Or they're going to make it so uh, expensive that Italy. Now, Italy is different than all these other countries because they have a strong industrial base. They have a lot of comparative advantages. Look at how many people want to go there. That's a great resource. Uh, in fact, we had a talk last night by Paul Roma about the, you know, the attractiveness of a, a particular environment. He was talking about urbanization. I'm talking about countries. And indeed, as long as people want to go there and spend their money, that's a great resource. Uh, but that's not enough. Tourism is not enough. Italy has to become more competitive, and they've got to get down their national debt. I have no idea if Italy is, is going to default. All I can tell you is that the Italian companies need to become more competitive. And if you take a look at the numbers, they are still somewhere about third from the bottom. Incidentally, if you want uh, the best uh, country in Europe, it's the Netherlands in terms of our metric. As a matter of fact, I chose the winner of the World Cup in soccer by my metric. And I was rooting for the Netherlands. And it looked really good until the final. And damn it, Spain had to win it. So, uh, you know, Spain with a relatively uh, low Z score somehow won it. I was really rooting for the Netherlands for many reasons, but that, that was the main one. Uh, the United States, incidentally, is, looks quite strong by our metric. And I think one of our true strengths, a lot of concern now about the US government, the amount of debt we have outstanding, a lot of concern. And I'm concerned, too. We're going to have to pay back all that debt that we borrowed. Incidentally, do you know why we recovered so strongly? If you take a look at the original chart, why that uh, yield, curve, yield spread came down so much? Two reasons, at least in my opinion. One, the incredible amount of liquidity pumped into the system by the central bank, over $2 trillion. But that money had to be borrowed to some extent. And the stock market really turned around. And people feel much more um, confident and willing to uh, spend more and invest more when their stock uh, values go up. And so we need to keep the stock market up. And President Obama knows that. That's the way he's going to win re-election. If he wins, it's going to be because of the economy. Nothing else, in my opinion. That's the main thing. That's what causes presidents to win or lose elections. And he knows that the way to win an election is to have a buoyant stock market and people working. And people working, it's getting better, but it's still not there yet. And so it's going to be a very interesting race coming up. So let me conclude uh, in, in uh, just a moment. I just want to mention these other factors in passing because keep your eyes on them. One or two of them could jump up and bite us. Oh, incidentally, this is the latest numbers I had on the five-year PDs. Greece, Portugal, Italy's looking pretty good by the metric. So that's why I'm, pre you know, I'm not that negative on Italy. All I'm saying is that the, um, oh, strike it, yeah. I looked at the numbers and I got carried away because I want to say something nice about Italy. But uh, this is not my metric. This is the CDS implied five-year PD. May, again, this insurance premium. So the market likes Italy a lot better than it does Greece, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain. And this was last December. I'm more concerned about Italy than the market. That's the bottom line in, in this case. Contagion between markets. I'll skip over that. That's another talk about um, if you like to invest your money and you don't know where to put it in debt or equity, usually they are good alternatives. The last three years, they've been moving together with about a 0.8 correlation. In other words, one goes up, the other goes up, and vice versa. I'm talking about risky debt and equities. Maturity schedule on um, private and public debt. Well, what that means is that uh, at some point, you're going to have to pay back what you borrow. And this is what it looks like in terms of the private debt outstanding in the United States. And what you have to pay back in 
10, well, that's finished now, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on. So notice the key years of 2013 and 14. A lot of private debt has to be paid back, junk bonds, leverage loans, and commercial mortgages, and other debt. But these are three areas I'm looking at. But also, public debt, municipalities, the US government also has to pay back a lot of debt in these years. As long as the markets are buoyant and there's lots of liquidity, no problem. As long as the US dollar is considered the reserve currency and therefore people want to put their money, especially if there's any turmoil in the world, no problem. It could all change, however, if the world says, no longer do we think the US government is as solvent as we thought. And they begin to pull their money out just when we need to refinance all the increase in debt that we took on to get out of this recession. And don't forget, our interest rates are incredibly low. And that does not attract capital. It, capital goes generally to higher interest rates, especially if they consider it not so risky. Unfortunately for most investors, there's very little places in the world that are as risk-free as the United States. But let's keep our eyes on 13 and 14. 11, and probably 12 is not going to be a problem, at least in terms of default risk. Inflation. Well, I'm no expert on macro stuff, and maybe you'll have a speaker on it the risk of inflation in the future. But believe me, inflation is insidious, and its impact can be extremely important. Look what's going on in India today. Yes, they're very happy. They won the World Cup in cricket, and everybody's celebrating. And I don't even know what happened. Anybody know what happened to the stock market today? My guess is it went up. You know, people feel well, maybe they were all drunk, and so they didn't have time to invest. But at the same time, they feel good. And generally, short-term positive impact on winning the World Cup, whether it's soccer or um, cricket. Um, however, India is the worst performing stock market this year in the world. Why? Inflation. China has high inflation now, and trying to get their hands on it. Two of the biggest economies, certainly in that part of the world, and, and of course China in, in the whole world. And there's some you know, likelihood that inflation is going to increase in other countries too. The United States, well, as long as the demand is not so great, we're not going to have too much risk, but uh, the numbers in January and February were a little disturbing in the inflation rate. And when inflation goes up, so do interest rates. When interest rates go up, it means that companies that finance and have their repayment in what we call floating rate interest rates, meaning it changes over time along with general conditions like loans to banks, then companies are going to be hit with higher interest costs, as is the government to refinance. So inflation could be a real problem, just like deflation. We like small amounts of inflation. That keeps us um, happy. And then we have something which um, I don't know how important it is uh, to the rest of the world, but I think it's pretty, pretty important in the United States, and it's called municipal debt risk. In the United States, and this is the di uh, a big difference uh, uh, between um, uh, what's going on in Europe and, and the United States, we have not only the federal government that can issue debt, we have municipal uh, uh, cities, sewer districts, school districts, and the like. That's also possible in some other countries, like Italy. But the Italian government needs to have support from the um, uh, European Union, but the European Union is not a political union. And Germany could vote against helping out Italy, and so Italy may not be able to help out Venice or uh, Milan if they get into trouble. In the United States, if municipalities get into trouble, the federal government can help directly. They don't have to um, uh, do very much. It's probably in our fabric. However, the magnitude of the problem is severe. We have $3 trillion worth of municipal debt outstanding, $3 trillion. 
Um, that's about um, a third, maybe a quarter, of the federal uh, outstanding debt. But just take one state. I don't know how many of you know anything of what's going on in the state of Michigan. But Michigan, you know, the home of U.S. automobile manufacturing, Detroit, many other industries in that area, uh, the assessment is that 50 to 100 cities could go bankrupt in a year. Now, cities can go bankrupt, states cannot. It's against the federal law to go bankrupt if you're a, a state. It's part of our constitution, actually. And the reason is that you cannot go bankrupt if you're a state because bankruptcy is a federal law. And ironically, states are protected against the federal government from imposing on them some jurisdiction. So you cannot seek protection. And by the way, bankruptcy law is a protection law. It is not a negative thing. It protects companies during rehabilitation, what we call Chapter 11. But that's not available to states. But the point is, many cities now in the United States and some states, California, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, New York to some extent, have tremendous deficits now. The problem is, the way to get rid of deficits is to increase income. And it's hard to increase income when people are not working. And that's another reason why employment is so important. If we have uh, several cities in the United States going bankrupt, and it hits the news, again, the contagion effect could whipsaw us and could cause people to have less confidence in the US government. And this could cause a ripple effect throughout the world. So if you read in a little footnote on page 14 of your local newspaper about three or four cities in Michigan going bankrupt, this could be the beginning of a, uh, I wouldn't call it tsunami, but a, a wave of problems that we have to uh, come to grips with. And finally, the last bullet is uncertainty. And I must say that the financial markets have been extremely resilient given the situation in the Middle East today and in Japan. They have not suffered very much, as much as I would have thought, given what's happened. Maybe because there's a history that says that when the Kobe earthquake took place, what was that, 05? Uh, there was only a temporary uh, impact on the stock market in Japan, and then it came back. And actually, I know a lot of investors are actually licking their lips saying, you know, Japan might be an opportunity now because things are down, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent in Japan, and that's going to be um, uh, temporary. So uncertainties deal with where you can't put probabilities on it. Risk, you can put probabilities on. We can put probabilities on Europe. We can't put probabilities on something we don't know about. I think Peter said last night, uh, it's hard to predict or you can't predict the future. Well, I'd like to modify that. You can't predict the future on things that you don't think about. We may be able to predict the future on things that we think about and have some data and analysis and models for. But if we didn't think about it, I mean, we didn't think about a tsunami, really. We didn't think about this uproar uh, in the Middle East and uh, uh, three months ago, at least the, uh, the, the amount that's happened. And therefore, we didn't prepare for it. We couldn't. Uh, I'm uh, quite impressed, actually, uh, how the markets have been resilient in this respect. So that's my laundry list. Um, the one that I'm uh, most concerned with is Europe. Um, I do think there's going to be further problems in Europe before, and I don't know the solution, frankly. I don't really see the solution there. I think we need restructuring of the debt of these countries. And as long as the politi politicians say, thou shalt never touch the euro, and we won't let you default, there's going to be this you know, uh, problem of you know, the uh, immovable force, et cetera. And so um, I don't know how they're going to get out of it unless they become more competitive. And it's hard to become more competitive without devaluing the currency. With that, uh, I will end and be happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your patience.
finance is not my profession, but uh, on your last topic, uh, isn't this a solution actually for the stronger European economies to bail out the weaker ones? Yeah, uh, it's, in fact, it's a very good point. Uh, they're not doing it because they like the Greeks or they like the uh, Portuguese. They're doing it because they're concerned about their own banks. Um, uh, the Germans are concerned about their banks, etc. Uh, and yes, that's why, uh, along with this political capital of the euro, I mean, tremendous uh, emotional and um, the political uh, um, capital that's been put into the euro. And so we're going to protect something we've been fighting for, and you know, we're trying to become unique as a uh, European Union. But my concern is th th that's true. On the other hand, Ms. Merkel needs to be voted in. And it's the people in the streets who might be saying, why should I keep supporting the Greeks who retire five years earlier than I do and who make 14 months of salary when I make 12. Uh, and so while the politicians uh, know the economics much better than the average person in the street and they know the uh, political capital involved and that's why they're going to continue to support the euro as much as they can. Uh, uh, they're doing it for their own well-being, you're saying, and that's true but they have to be in power. You know? Sarkozy has to be in power. Merkel has to be in power. And if it's a completely different party, well, who's the, the new party in, in Germany now? The Greens. And I don't know how much the Greens care about Greece. They do care about nuclear energy. And so that's you know, a new issue for, uh, for, uh, for Germany. There seems to be a significant shift in, in currencies around the world with, with China and others running huge surpluses, the West and the US in particular running massive deficits. To what extent do your, does your model reflect that? And, and does that really mean that the dollar is going to be weak for a long time? Well, um, first of all, I'm surprised that the euro has remained as strong as it has. That's the first thing. Because of these problems, you would think that the euro would fall in value. Um, uh, so, I, and I never try to forecast currencies because I know that's, you know, very difficult to do and uh, very dangerous. Um, don't forget, a lot of companies in, uh, and I should talk about the flaws of our model as well now. It's a good point, it's a time to bring it up. One of the problems of our model is that we only use data from companies that are listed on the stock exchange because that's where we can get the data. If I had access to the central banks of the world to run our model, then I'd be much comfortable, more comfortable that the metric we've produced is indicative of the whole country as opposed to a small number of firms that are listed. Some countries like the Netherlands, UK, and um, even the United States have a lot of companies that make a lot of money outside their borders. And therefore, um, the, and the money does not come back to the United States, at least not immediately, in the form of dividends to investors and reinvestment in the U.S., it's reinvested elsewhere. And so the um, type of deficits that you're talking about are deficits that, of the countries, not necessarily the companies, um, uh, uh, which, you know, a company like General Electric does more, much more business outside the U.S. than, the, than inside. Um, but deficits in general are bad for the companies and the countries. Um, but if those companies, like General Motors today, are selling a lot of cars uh, made of foreign products, and uh, they can do very well, and their Z-score, incidentally, we predicted General Motors would go bankrupt. We testified in Congress that they should go bankrupt. And at that time, uh, they weren't doing business very well in the U.S. or outside the U.S. The thing that's really turned around General Motors is their business outside the U.S., particularly in China. You know, Buick sells more cars in China than any other car in the world. Surprising, isn't it? Um, uh, and 
you know, we were almost ready to get rid of the Buick division because it was another albatross in the, in the uh, North America, but it's doing very well, tremendously well in China. So uh, yes, deficits are a problem in terms of balance of trade and surplus or, res uh, or deficits of reserves. Incidentally, China, which um, uh, ha has an enormous amount of problems in banks and companies, most Chinese companies are not very profitable. I'll tell you that right now. Just like uh, the Koreans weren't all that profitable back then. They're growing tremendously, but they take a lot of investment and are not very profitable, and their Z-score is probably not very high. The thing about China that is different than Korea was is their enormous amount of reserves. Two and a half trillion dollars today. So if their problem is manifested in you know, deficits, uh, sorry, deficits of companies needing bailing out, then they have the wherewithal to do it. Uh, um, Greece doesn't, the uh, UK doesn't, uh, and so on. Uh, so try to answer your question. I don't, I'm not too concerned with deficits as long as you can finance it. The US deficit is a problem only if we cannot either repay or finance it in the future. And so far, it's the only game in town, and has been that way for a long time. And I think it's going to continue. Uh, I'd like to know your view on systemic risk going forward in the future, you know, uh, how it's going to affect the market. So you're talking about, uh, his question deals with a term called <coughs> systemic risk. And systemic risk is kind of a, this um, a risk that will spread uh, like, a, like a disease to many other individuals, or in this case, you're talking about countries now or, or companies? Companies, um, and they're, uh, okay, then are you referring to the company's reliance on the country uh, in systemic risk? Okay, that's a, that was a question. Um, it was a little different than I, I thought. Um, the very serious problem, first of all. Uh, what happened in the United States in this um, terrible uh, global financial crisis that the epicenter was New York, I'm sorry to say, uh, you know, that's where the eruption started with the, the banks uh, in particular, but you know, it was also in, in the UK, um, and then spread the systemic risk by that. For companies, I don't see systemic risk as all that serious for companies, and I'll tell you why. Companies, um, uh, you, can, you as an investor um, can diversify. Or companies can diversify. They can become a conglomerate and whatever. So systemic risk for a company affecting uh, other companies, uh, generally if uh, one company is in trouble, uh, another company could benefit by being, you know, getting the market share that that company has lost. That's what happens in airlines, for example. One company goes down, another goes up. Uh, also, investors, can say, okay, I don't like um, this company because I don't like the industry, I'll buy a different industry, or I'll go outside the country. So I, I don't really, I'm not too concerned with systemic risk of companies. I am concerned with countries. I think this is the issue, this contagion effect or uh, conta uh, contamination effect of two or three and then a big one, defaulting. Then people say, I'm getting out of Europe, period. Or I'm going to require too high an interest rate. So the short term, there are people now putting money actually into Greek bonds. I know it. Because they can get high yield. As long as they feel the European Central Bank is there to support them, they can get over 10% above the risk-free rate in Greece. It's almost impossible to get that on anywhere else except for maybe Portugal today. <laughs> and so it attracts capital. Once they say, okay, no more, the probability of default is too high, I'm pulling my money out. Let me ask you a question. Think about what happened in Asia back in 1997 and 8. What was the cause of the Asian problem? I'll give you two theories. One theory is that Westerners generally pull their money out of the economies, and this caused a run on the currency. 
and everything went downhill after that. And there was this systemic risk in countries. The other theory is that the fundamentals of the economies were weak. So one, it's your fault, and one, it's your fault. Your fault being the Western capital, your fault being the local economies. I believe it's much more the fundamentals of the local economies. And this is why, and this, I didn't say it, what's the bottom line to our analysis? Nurture, don't tax and destroy the private sector in countries in trouble. Subsidize them. Get them going again. Because they're the ones that are going to pay the taxes, and they're the ones that are going to be higher than the workers. You've got to support private industry rather than tax them and that's why I'm concerned about these austerity programs. Uh, an eminent economist in the United States, Paul Krugman, wrote an ed editorial just a few weeks ago in, the, uh, in New York, well, probably in many other places, about whether or not we are wise to cause Greece, Ireland, Portugal, etc., to have these serious austerity programs, cut back on expenses and increase taxes and the like. Um, because austerity makes things worse. You go into a giant recession, you may not be able to come out of it unless you do something very dramatic. So I, I, I agree with that, by the way. On the, on the US dollar, and the problems of the US are somewhat not that different to the European problems, except that it has its own central bank and currency. If we were to have a US dollar crisis, and the US dollar weakening beyond control, what options would be available to the US to avoid default and bankruptcy? Well, I guess if you're saying the crisis gets to the point that we can no longer issue government debt that others want to buy. In that case, you could always have the Federal Reserve monetizing the debt. So the currency would which be they're doing, a mechanism. Which yes. they're doing right now. If the foreigners lose confidence in the US and the reserve status of the currency goes, what happens? Yes. What could happen? Uh, I guess, sorry, it's a difficult question, but what yeah. I'm trying to point well, out is I, that I, Europe's I, a problem, but the that's US... That's why I'm a professor and not a, uh, uh, a central banker. Well, uh, uh, perhaps uh, my colleague Peter Henry can help out on that one, but it would be a disaster. Um, if people lose confidence in a country and its currency, I don't care who it is, the United States or anyone else, um, now, the United States not only has you know, a, a very large economy, so we can depend a lot on our domestic economy um, uh, to generate uh, revenues even when others are not providing it, um, then we will go downhill and we'll have to find another alternative. Um, the U.S. juggernaut of, a, of an economic powerhouse is on the decline. There's no question about it relative to uh, other countries in the world. This is probably not unnatural in the world to have people at the top and then begin to come down. Uh, I, I don't have a good solution to it if they have a combination of uh, low productivity, people lose confidence, pull their money out, and interest rates have to go up to attract capital because that's going to put pressure on everyone. Um, and there's, the thing is, there's no place else to go, at least not right now. No, I mean, are you going to put your money into China? You've got to believe the numbers to put your money with it. And um, uh, I'm not saying uh, uh, that the numbers are not uh, real. It's just that it's... China cannot continue to uh, grow at the rate that they've been growing, just like any other country. And money is going to flow elsewhere. So I don't think China is going to be the place that people are going to buy their, their government bonds. I just don't see any, any other alternative. Um, you, you mentioned that about 40% of the sovereign bonds of European nations are owned by banks. Uh, no, I didn't say that. That was, it that was Italy. That was in Italy. That was I Italy. I think in, in general, the European banks hold a lot of their sovereign debt from different European unions. European banks hold debt of other European countries, countries in Europe. Correct. Um, and then there's this talk now about a, 
the buy-in, which basically, um, I don't know if you heard the expression, it's a voluntary haircut that you would, the yes. banks would take? That's, the, that's what I was talking about, the voluntary haircut. Yeah. That's another nice way to put it. And in that case, then, wouldn't that affect the capital of the banks? Absolutely. So you're decapitalizing the banking system, and does Europe have the reserve to absolutely re right. We just went through a financial crisis. Okay. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Let me um, editorialize on that for a moment. How many of you have ever heard of something called the Brady Plan? A few, okay. Well, Nicholas Brady was the Secretary of Treasury back in the 80s. Nicholas Brady, who's still alive and vibrant, came up with his staff the Brady Plan to bail out Latin American debt uh, countries in Latin America, which were we had a similar situation in Latin America that we have now in Europe. The way it worked, and I'm no expert on the Brady Plan, but I know enough about it to know that there were several key ingredients, some of which is possible in Europe, some is more difficult. One thing is the, um, um, the U.S. government issued 30-year zero-coupon bonds, meaning no interest and you get paid back at the end of 30 years 100% uh, of the amount, and you only have to, to buy those bonds, you only have to pay like half of it now. So there's an implied interest rate in the increase in principal. So that money, those bonds, were used as collateral by the Latin American countries to restructure the debt that they owned other people. And the banks, that owned this debt of Latin America took a haircut, 30, 40, 50 percent. But they got 30-year bonds guaranteed by the U.S. government to get paid back, and they accepted that. Incidentally, the countries that used this collateral bought this debt from the U.S. with money from the IMF. So it was this very determined group to bail out Latin America. And it was called the Brady Plan. So the question is, can we do a Brady Plan for Europe, the equivalent of it? Can the European Central Bank issue their own debt to use as collateral by the countries in Europe? And the countries in Europe buy this debt. They're not giving it. They buy it at a discount from the Central Bank. This, and then the investors have to go along by taking a haircut. Uh, yes, the banks will, no, no doubt about it, but it's not just the banks. It's hedge funds, too. And hedge funds, around this table, when they negotiate this, there's a 26-year-old hedge fund guy and a 50-year-old banker. And a 50-year-old banker has been through this before, and he knows this is really the best medicine. But the hedge fund guy probably bought this debt at 50 cents on the dollar, and he wants 70 cents. So that haircut is only 30 percent compared to the banker who might have been willing to take 50. And so Nicholas Brady now says he doesn't know whether his plan would work. And by the way, there was a conference that Elaine and I went to a month ago or less and it was this discussion, and Nick Brady was in on the panel. And he, he himself, he's a modest guy, he says, I don't know if my plan will work for Europe. But this is the kind of things that people are thinking of now. The thing that they don't want happening, incidentally, keep your eye on this too, they do not want a restructuring in Europe that will trigger a default in the CDS market. For those of you who are in the markets, Remember that the CDS market, again, is this insurance market. The insurance market, somebody's got to pay off as well as somebody's going to collect. And it's the people who have to pay off the counterparty risk that we're worried about. That's why they saved AIG and didn't save Lehman Brothers of this counterparty risk in credit derivatives and other markets. There is actually a literature on austerity programs, or as we call them, um, fiscal consolidation. Do they work? Um, I'm not sure, but 
the literature says, yes. um, led by Alberto Alessina and Roberto Perotti and, and Silvia Ardania, yeah. they say um, in order for them to be successful, they need to cut spending rather than increase taxes. Yeah. So, in your opinion, would it be possible for maybe um, Portugal or Spain to not default um, just by cutting expenditure and, and leaving private sector alone, you know, not touching taxes. Yeah. Um, or you can say the same thing for Greece, too. Yeah. Um, is it possible to cut spending, which they're trying to do? I mean, the Spanish um, have passed some austerity programs. Certainly the Greeks have. Um, uh, Ireland has. Uh, and I don't think they've increased taxes, if, uh, which is a smart thing. Uh, to the private sector, certainly. They're trying to collect more taxes, which is a big problem, not only in Greece. I mean, in Italy, it's a huge problem. Um, you travel enough in Italy, and you realize how much money is not being reported to the government. And it's probably not just a European uh, issue. Um, I don't know the answer whether or not cutting spending is enough. To me, the only way to be for a country to, to, to make it bail out, whatever, not, uh, to, to make it, is to become more competitive. And I don't see how you become more competitive. Sure, if you cut spendages and it cuts the wages down, but the amount that they'd have to cut in Greece and Spain is dramatic. Um, I'm hopeful about Spain, but they've got to cut that unemployment. 20% is just, in, and, and it's very high at the younger people level, which is always the case. And those are the people who are <clears throat> going to be, you know, have a long productivity, hopefully, going forward. And if they can't get jobs, they're going to give up and go elsewhere. And so that country is going to be, uh, you know, Paul Roma's urbanization. Uh, for, how many of you were here last night, you heard about uh, this urbanization? Well, <clears throat> one thing that attracts people to cities is jobs, whether it be cities or countries. And one thing that causes them to leave is lack of jobs. So cutting spending is not going to generate jobs, at least not in the short run. Uh, I'm pessimistic that it's going to be enough. I think not only do you not have to raise taxes, you've got to cut taxes. Thank you very much. <laughs>